our next speakers are Helen Beetham, who uh, we've already introduced. Uh, Helen um, is an independent consultant in digital technologies, e-learning. E um, uh, she's been with us in Exeter for the past eight months, um, but she also is involved in a lot of other um, exciting projects across the country. Um, and Martin Oliver, um, who's joined us today from the University of London, the Institute of Education. You're also leading a JISC-funded I'm on a just funded project, project um, about which you will say more about. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, very happy to welcome you here both, and you're going to talk to us um, about some research into students' digital practices. Thank you. Thank you, Dilly, for that amazing and inspiring opening. Um, Martin and I are, have researched together in the past, and um, we are working on parallel projects at the moment. But I think we're going to sort of split this halfway, our, our session now, and hopefully what we have to say will be sort of reasonably congruent with each other. I thought it was great to hear from Dilly um, the, the, the real questions that traditional academic practice and values can ask of technology, because coming perhaps more from the e-learning world, I'm very familiar with the sense that technology is asking all kinds of questions of the academy. Why do you assess us in this way? What value is my, my degree going to be in a digital world? Um, and it's really important, I think, that those questions are asked both ways, not least perhaps because so many of the technologies that are familiar to our students actually originate in academic research communities and in their practices, however they then get appropriated for social practices. So it's really great that we're part of an event that can ask that question in both directions, really. Um, I was also interested to hear Dilly talk for the first time actually about her telling tales, although I've been, been well aware of it, because perhaps the first time I became involved in, uh, in talking to students intensively was about, about 2007, a series of nine projects that were looking at students' experiences of learning, <coughs> and in a very similar way to Dilly, asking students in a holistic way about their experiences of using technology in a study environment, and it, it seems amazing to think of now, but actually prior to that, most of the studies into students' use of technology would kind of introduce a technology and then ask students how it went, basically. Oh, you know, look at that particular technical intervention. The idea that there was technology out there that hadn't been given to students and they hadn't been told how to use it was sort of new. And I think the idea of asking students in a holistic way about how their identity was developed and produced through their use of technology, quite apart from their study use of it, was also, was also at that time quite, quite unusual. And that was followed up a couple of years later by a study into, into how learners, learners learn in a digital age, taking that much more holistic view, which has led to the programme that Martin and I are both working on at the moment. Um, and I think for me, what's been exciting has been to, to talk to students over quite a few years now about how they are surfing that, that turbulent space between digital culture and academic culture. And I'm, I'm making that distinction advisedly, knowing that the two are not actually nearly as separate as both sides of the equation imagine them to be. Um, and there's an awful lot of listening in this first bit, so I think, like Dilly, I'd like to sort of take, take a buzz moment now for you to think and talk to your neighbour a little bit about what it looks like when you see students doing that successfully. In other words, when you see students um, successfully bringing their digital know-how into the space of study or academic work and using it in a, in a positive way for all those values that, that maybe that you share with Dilly or that you hold about what good learning looks like. So, so just share an example with a close colleague about that successful surfing moment that you might have witnessed. discussion some of these examples will come back but it obviously we all do have things to say about students being successful the panel session in a little while we'll look at some of the challenges but there are successes to be seen out there um, so I just want to say a little bit about what some of the some of the research has thrown up about students digital practices 
And, and, and the first one, as I alluded to, is of course that digital technology is absolutely ubiquitous in students' lives. If they want to exclude digital technology, they have to go to quite extreme lengths to do that. And I've talked to students who literally will put themselves in a locked room or put their phone and their, and their laptop in a different place so they're not distracted by what they see as unhelpful technical um, interventions in their study time. But um, we've gone from a time when technology in the classroom meant something that probably sat in its own special room. You had to load up with a programme. You had to go to a special place to do it. You had to have very special technical skills. And you probably had to spend a lot of time training your students to do it. So kind of laptops being all over the place. And we're used to projectors in most, most teaching spaces. So students having their own devices and, and us having to now think about how we feel about them using those devices. I mean, I was sitting there tweeting away while Dilly was talking, which in, in, in this field that I move in is entirely acceptable and normal, but there are some conferences in which that would be regarded as absolutely not okay. And I hope that the feedback I gave showed that actually there was a scholarly discussion going on there, but how did you know that I wasn't actually doing my email and so on? So the, the world has moved, technology is ubiquitous. Learners' devices are really um, much more significant to them than any technology we can put into their hands or into their minds. But at the same time, and, and Martin and I have been having this debate for many years now, the idea that students are digital natives and therefore the problem is kind of solved for them is one we have to really question. So there's research on this, on this slide, which some of you may be familiar with, that really makes that argument very strongly, that learners developing their own knowledge practices through their engagement with technology, that they're building their own knowledge, building communities, that they're reviewing other people's work by their, by their likes, their comments, their tweets, their recommends, and, and so therefore they have in, in embryo academic practices that we can just kind of tease out of them when, when they arrive with these technologies. And, and I'm, I'm deliberately in a way um, not addressing that question of the digital divide and that there are many students who don't arrive with these practices, but increasingly a lot of them do. And that seems to be where um, people in academic support and practice roles experience a sort of degree of threat. So the, the work that, that, that I have done over the years has definitely shown that students do use social media and their own personal devices to fit study into busy lives. And, and you know, talking about the whole person as Dilly was, this is incredibly important to students as whole people, that they, can, that they can use their technology to find a space to study, to make it a space that works for them. And they're using personal devices increasingly to capture and record moments of learning. They might be wanting to record lectures and seminars, they might be using digital cameras to take pictures of an experiment or a piece of field work, maybe not being prompted to do that, but, but, but they're doing so. So they have these moments which could be moments of reflection, but maybe they're not moments of reflection, but they could be. They have all kinds of opportunities to capture and then later reflect on the things they're doing. They absolutely rely on access to digital course materials, and that's where there's a lot of student expectation attached now. They gather and share and repurpose digital assets. It doesn't necessarily mean they're doing good learning in a sense of transformative learning. They're gathering, but, but, but again, as, as, as academic practitioners, we need to be aware that there is that facility to constantly monitor, capture, gather, repurpose, share, put out there to your friends stuff that you're doing, and that that can be a trigger for reflection and for deeper learning. Judging information. Okay, we all have concerns about students' judgment of online information, but students actually, from, from the studies, do have very strategic ways of using their facility with online information. Now, you may not be able to see this at the back. This comes from a focus group I run with students actually at the University of Plymouth. And it's a very typical response when you kind of get students relaxed and talking honestly about the no-go areas of Google and Wikipedia that they kind of know they're expected not to do. And they say, well, of course we use Google and Wikipedia. We use them all the time. And then we find out what we're really meant to know, and we copy down some references and we put them, we, maybe we go and look up the references in the library catalogue. That's a good practice. Go Google Scholar, we use Google Book. And then we put the references in our essays in ways that we know will make them acceptable. You know, we don't reference the Wikipedia or the Google article. They're not stupid. You know, this is actually very canny. And I'm not going to stand here and say that there aren't academics who do that when they write scholarly articles. But, you know, I think that there are, there are strategies students have for using their ability to find information, which allow them to present themselves successfully in an academic way. And we need to be aware of those strategies, rather than banning them, finding ways of drawing out from those quite clever ways of approaching different sources of, of, of information. And the sense that some sources of information seem to be more acceptable than others, what the values actually are that make those sources of information different peer-reviewed, shared in different, and so on, you know. So it's a drawing out of, of some of the strategies they already have. However, 
digital, digital natives myth, you know, slightly questioned. Most, if you even just look at basic ICT skills, most mm -hmm. learners, students, basic ICT skills, we're not even talking about the capacity to use them for self-transformation, are lower than their tutors think and lower than they think, actually, in practice. And the characterisation of young people, particularly as digital natives, hides a whole range of contradictions in their experiences, particularly the ways in which they're differentiated. And actually, the use of technology is becoming a new source of differentiation among students. OK, if we're standing at the front and we don't know how to use any of it, they all look similarly digitally able. But in fact, they're able in very, very different ways. Some of them are very able with digital photography. They use images a lot. Some of them are very social. They tweet. We've actually, um, Dale and I have developed a kind of categorisation of what kind of digital researcher are you that, that helps people in a kind of coffee table quiz type way to understand which bits of this digital environment they're very good and happy with and which bits they feel less comfortable with. So there's a huge differentiation there. And in particular, learners have a lot of difficulties transposing personal and social practices with, te with technology into the academic domain. And I think that's where we are talking about these issues of identity and value. Okay, so I maybe I can I, I feel I'm exercising judgment when I judge various kinds of communications and information I have access to, perhaps through my through my <coughs> browser or my, my apps or my mobile phone. But how do I understand what's required of me when I apply judgment in an academic sense? Okay. And also some work that's been done um, actually at Martin's institution has shown that the idea that students are actively blogging, writing wikis, contributing <laughs> creatively online. It, you know, certainly a few years ago, I think that picture is changing. It was quite a minority activity. When you ask students who were doing that, a lot of them had been taught to do it by teachers. <laughs> it had been introduced in an academic context. So I shall skip over this to, um, to the project that I'm more involved with now. Um, what we have been doing at Exeter is working with a group of digital pioneers. So, so really people who are at the cutting edge in a sense of their subject area, they're mainly postgraduate research students, but also at the cutting edge in a sense of using technology. And we're not doing that because we think they're the only people who matter, but because we think they're people who are surfing that wave very successfully. They can teach their supervisors and their professors a thing or two, and certainly as new career teachers, they can teach undergraduates a thing or two about, about negotiating that territory. And I'm going to just give you a few examples from that work, um, and you know, maybe there'll be time for you to come back with some, some ideas of yours. One, one is about referencing, and um, we, had a, we had a workshop with these digital pioneers about the kinds of referencing they do. And we found that almost exclusively they were using Zotero or Mendeley, even though the university supports EndNote and encourages the use of EndNote through training. And, uh, you know, EndNote is a very good system, I'm not saying anything against it, but why were they using Zotero? Because Zotero fits in your browser, and it fits with practices of finding information that they had acquired in, in non-academic contexts largely and wanted to bring over to their academic practice. It worked for them, it was accessible, it was available. This, um, this slide I had here was trying to contrast a word of uh, people talking about academic practice with talking about digital academic practice, and the words access and available are very prominent in this one. So it's available and it's accessible to them. Why did they use Mendeley? Because Mendeley is essentially a social network, and it fits with their practices of sharing and sharing information. So the underlying values there are quite familiar. They want to be able to acknowledge your, their sources. They want to share their sources. They want to build on the knowledge of others. They want to say, hey, look, this is what I'm looking at. What are you looking at? And they're finding ways of bringing those digital values into an, into an academic sort of frame. And at the start of an academic career, in fact, being able to um, find out who else is referencing the same things you are, to be able to build a map of your knowledge domain, to know other people who are doing the same kinds of things that you're doing, and to very quickly capture a large range of references is much more important than formatting them correctly. I hate to say this in a, t in a, in a room, I'm, I'm going to have to run after I say this. The software now will format things correctly for you. But what these students cared about was actually getting access to the references in the first place. And I think that's going back to what Dilly was saying. That's an argument for expressing the underlying values about why we do referencing, as opposed to the forms. You know, because the forms can change, but the values are what matter. Now, I'm unfortunately, tragically, not. I don't think I have time to show a video, but I will maybe put it up at lunchtime. Which is some of our interns um, actually creating an RSA. How many of you have seen the RSA animate talks where there's a hand drawing? Okay, so we were doing quite a serious session on data visualisation. 
And three of them went off and said, right, I'm, we're just going to... I, I can see how we can do that. They had a marker pen, a whiteboard, and a mobile phone. <coughs> and they created, basically, an RC animation. I'll put it up so you can see. It's, it's quite brilliant. But I'm, the, the point being that they were able to talk about data visualisation as an academic practice at the same time and in the same space that they were being very playful with their own digital capabilities and know-how. And the video they produced is extremely playful, it's good fun, I couldn't possibly have done it. I mean, I watched them doing it and I was like, I couldn't even have thought of that, let alone done it. But I mean, it's, and, they, and they put it up on YouTube and anyone, anyone can go and see it. But it was in the context of a serious discussion about what it means to, to use data creatively and, and in a research context. Another of our interns is looking at academic writing, and this is from our, our blog where interns discuss the kind of thing they're doing. And actually there's been a really serious discussion on the blog, about uh, which began with Amy asking other students, how do you write? How do you generate ideas for writing? What happens when you want to, I'm um, to talk about referencing, what happens when you want to make your writing really polished for different audiences? Um, how do you kind of uh, go about editing? What happens? And really interesting things emerging about the use of notebooks, uh, people putting paper on the floor, people using mind maps, people using all kinds of software, people having a personal repertoire of tools they use for writing, which involves an exchange between physical paper and different kinds of technologies, and that that repertoire being really part of their identity as producing academic ideas. And one of the things that Amy and I, in collaboration with Nell's team, are doing is producing um, a kind of a resource for students about writing, about digital writing. I mean, this is just a shell, it's, it's not populated yet. But we've already identified that a way to draw people in is to talk about using the right tools for referencing, thinking of ideas, collaborative writing, um, mixing and repackaging, polishing. If we talk about the tools that are ready, we can also then use words like authority, voice, originality, finding the public-private divide in your writing. So there's all kinds of large agendas that can come in on the back of just asking students, what tools do you use for these different aspects of the writing experience? And the thing I want to finish on, although it's not something that's come directly out of our project, and there's a chance to hear from Ian Cook this afternoon, who I don't know if he's here yet, who has been um, promoting this work in his undergraduate, with his undergraduate students, but I think, for me, the idea of the uniquely critical approach that higher education offers to the digital world we find ourselves in. I mean, I've expressed it as having the capacity to, to question the means for which technology is offered as the ends. And I think we see with our interns a great capacity to do that. And with lots of undergraduates who are beginning to ask why Facebook wants to do things with their data that they're not happy with, why they have to use Facebook rather than... Uh, other things that might be able. So there's a, there's a criticality about technology coming in. But what Ian has his undergraduates to do is to write web pages about um, the journey of things in the world. And this is particularly about laptops uh, as having physical people who actually create them and physically produce them in different parts of the world, how they're transported, how they're made, how they enter into our culture, how they enter into our discourse. And through doing this, the students are developing a very critical approach to taking for granted technologies. But they're also... It, as it happens, developing skills of presenting public web pages, of presenting their views, of having uh, online discussions about them, you know, very employable, marketable skills as they engage in these critical practices. So I think I, I'm going to leave it there and just say that I think what we've seen is our students developing these hybrid practices between their academic and their digital know-how. And I think I feel incredibly encouraged that there are people who are pioneering in this that we can draw from, but only if we're prepared to step back and treat students' digital know-how as a resource that we can bring into the academic domain, not as a threat, not as a distraction, but actually as a resource for us to rethink what it means to be effective thinkers and critical beings in, um, in, a, in a digital world. I think... Martin, do you want to, shall I, what you're setting up, shall I see if there's a question or two? Yeah. Is that, is that? Okay. There will be time, Martin and I are both on the panel, but if there's anyone wants to make a contribution or question at this point, while well, Martin's setting up. But, it's, but, they're, but they're interacting around the references they want to share. So it's basically a way of finding people who are referencing the same kinds of things. Just as Facebook allows you to find people who are interested in the same things you're interested in, yes. Mendeley allows you to find people who are interested in the same things you're interested in an academic kind of way. So it's 
So it's using ma many of things that feel very familiar to students. So they, they, you know, they naturally want to share, they want to know who else is looking at this, but it's to help them build a kind of mental map of their of their referencing area of their like I should just say one of the workshops this afternoon is looking at yes. Mendeley. So if you want to sign up for that one, just sign up the door on the doors. And it's led by one of our in two of our interns in fact. Okay, this is not a separate talk. This is directly following on from what Helen's been talking about, and I hope you'll see the continuity through this. Um, it also, in a way, sort of carries on the movement that you've seen from Dilly's initial framing to, through to what I'm going to get to, which is some very particular, very detailed examples. Um, so for the context, this is based on the projects that um, Helen's referred to already. This one is based at the Institute of Education, called Digital Literacy as a Postgraduate Attribute. Two-year project, but really it's focusing on these questions. What do our students do and what do they need? and then what can we change in order to help them? So it's got a very pragmatic orientation. But we're actually trying to do it as a very researchy kind of project. So the entire first year of the project really is about trying to understand what our students do, and that's the bit I'll be focusing on. So yeah, Leslie Gourlay is leading the project. Um, I'm here representing the project team. But this, what I'm going to be talking about, is really building on work that uh, Leslie, myself, and Jude Franceman, our a research fellow, have been working on together. Before I get into that, what I really want to do is, I kind of feel with this talk I'm telling you what you already know, and I kind of want to prove that to you. There isn't really going to be anything radically surprising in this, but I hope it's unfamiliar enough to get you thinking about it. So I thought, a little thought experiment, just as the others have asked you to talk to each other, but this time I'm going to ask you to talk to me. So there's three, ex three examples here. Would it still make sense to talk about people having digital literacy in the early Industrial Revolution? If you're looking at cargo cultists who have found an iPad and are downloading apps on it, or if you're looking at tech-savvy people who've got lost on a desert island will never again be able to plug their laptops in, their batteries are dead, they will never be able to use it, would, would it still make sense to talk about digital literacy? I think it probably would in the, in the third instance, Martin, because in the third instance you've got people who have evolved a particular way of thinking about the world, about the, the possibilities. Although, um, it, <coughs> if they're never going to get rescued uh, in that scenario, it may not matter, but I think it, it probably has something to do with the way they interact with each other. Whereas in the early Industrial Revolution, um, the way we think of digital literacy simply wouldn't mean anything to those individuals. Okay. Literacy would be important, but not the digital effort. Anyone else want to say anything in relation, please? Anyone want to challenge that view or add something else? Could you tell us what a cargo, cargo, cargo cultist cult. is? Right, OK. Cargo cults were when they had these sort of remote islands and they established air bases. And the, the air force would come in and deliver cargo. And the local people would look at this and see, oh, well, if they're waving these paddles about, these great metal birds come in and deliver mm -hmm. these goods, maybe we can do that too. So they'd fake paddles and landing strips mm -hmm. and wait for the big metal birds to come down. I'm not understand why they never got any cargo, but it had this ritualistic aspect to it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to comment on any of these? Anybody? Go on. Yeah. The issues with it, you know, I'm not qualified to get the whether conceptually you believe there's a difference between digital literacy and what would have previously perhaps constituted knowledge literacy or information literacy, and whether it's actually a distinct yeah. form, or whether it's just a continuation of kind of method of thinking about the world, methods of thinking about the world that's been around for yeah. 200 years. Yeah, I mean, that's a fair point. This is certainly not something radically discontinuous from everything else that's going on. Going on. <clears throat> but it is, as you say, something which is developing from it. There's, it's not the same now, arguably, as it was 100 years ago. I'm not going to labour this point, but the way that we've been trying to think about it is in terms of laying claim to digital literacy involves a coordination of, of various things. It's not just an internal characteristic of the person, a skill they perform, but it involves people and networks of people. It involves devices, it involves places, it involves practices, it involves the kind of infrastructures they're drawing on as well. So their skills are important, their attitudes and dispositions are important, but if all you've got is the attitude and disposition and no means to enact that, you may have the potential for digitally, to be digitally literate, but you're not being digitally literate. You're not acting in a digitally literate way. And that's really what we want our students to be doing. So we are trying to think differently about, you know, about skills, about supporting the students' skills, and what it might mean to work with students to, to help them act in a digitally literate manner. 
way well, we've done this, as I said, there's this first year which is all about the research work, and that's what I'm going to focus on. So we've started with a very broad overview of where our students are at, which is drawing on an iGraduate survey, which happens anyway. So we've pulled out things that are relevant to the project from this existing body of data. And we've then gone on through focus groups to a journaling study. And this is, in some ways, again, this sort of getting students to tell us their stories. But what we're doing, we've given them iPod touches and we've got told them to go and take images and sort of write accounts and take videos and give us quite a rich set of data to work with. And Helen's very modestly scooted over this framework, which has been hugely useful to the whole program of projects, which she worked on with Rona Sharp, which has got digital literacy in terms of access, skills, social practices and identities. So you can see those themes are coming out of what Helen was talking about, but you know, that's, that's been hugely useful to us in terms of structuring our thinking around this as an area. So this review, I don't want to get too much into the detail of it, because the detail of what's happening for us isn't directly relevant to you, so I just want to use this as an example. But the kind of things we're talking about around access, there was lots of it. Students know when they can't get access to stuff. It's a very obvious problem for them. And so the things about the delays of registering for the virtual learning environment, wanting more open access computers, some of them who just did not know how to access. I mean, you know, there's a bit of a big push to put lots of information about courses online. And then students come to us and saying, well, I don't know how to look up web pages. So all this stuff they used to get posted to them in hard copy, they can't now find. Um, and things about sort of when they want these kind of things as well. There was almost, almost nothing in their feedback about skills per se. This was not how they thought about what they were doing. They didn't say, I want development in this particular skill. They were always talking about other kinds of things. Mostly what they were talking about were what we would characterise as study practices. So it's not, you know, not the moment-to-moment -moment techniques of how they do stuff, it's about the meaning of this, and particularly in an academic context. Who they want to talk to, and what they want to talk to them about, and why they're having a discussion in the first place. There were things about policies around responses to emails and password changes, which just drove them nuts. They couldn't understand why there were, why there were important security concerns around this. They just knew that they had to change their password. And they had no way of coming up with new passwords. So they were constantly forgetting what they had. So there's all these kind of things which made sense to certain groups, totally baffling to the students. And they said almost nothing about their identity or the identity of the things or people they were working with. Again, that's something which was not coming out from this blanket level survey, which is the reason we had to then push on from this to look in more detail. I and mean, what we did was broke this up. We assumed, again, differentiation in our student body. We are not trying to assume there is a standard student who has stable characteristics. We're trying to look at that bre the breadth, the variation, the differences in them. We were looking, the Institute of Education is primarily postgraduate. So we're looking at PGCE students, MA students, and doctoral students, or our three main groups of students, and a specific group of students who are studying with us, but at a distance. So we're looking for variety in those courses, and we're asking them questions which have come out from that initial survey, but which are trying to get more detail about the resources, the domains that they operate in, the practices they're trying to undertake, and their sense of their identities. And the other thing we then followed up with was from those focus groups, we invited <coughs> students to carry on working with us on this longitudinal project. So I won't go through all the detail of this, but 12 students using iPod Touches, collecting their own data, and telling us their own stories about what it meant to them. So we both listen to their stories and try and analyse it. We're also encouraging them to structure that data and to give us that structure as a form of their own analysis. So they're doing their own structuring and accounting for what this means to them. This has come out a bit faint, but the detail of it doesn't really matter. We were getting them to draw maps about how they did their practice, their academic practice with technology. And this is a kind of representative image from the th things they were talking about. So they're talking about here, the Institute of Education and Birkbeck College, which is literally just a couple of minutes away. And this is them running between the two buildings, because that's what they did when they studied. They moved between meetings with, um, with, a, prof with a professor who they were working with, uh, a particular room where they used some very dedicated resources, other training rooms, and the library they chose to use was in a different college. There are some trees here, there's some thinking going on, there's reading on a train, and there's also these clouds down here. People, the internet, the outdoors, inspiration. But what it's showing is that sort of, this was not something that happened in classrooms. This was not something that happened in predefined spaces. This is something that sort of intermingled in really complicated ways with the whole of their lives. And this was the story we're trying to make sense of for them. 
So to go back to that framework that Helen's provided, starting off with the access, you know, there are some very familiar problems. There are some very basic issues just about, you know, we've brought this device into your institution, why won't your wireless network accept it? But we also came up with a longer list of the things that our students are using. You can, I'll put these slides up on Slideshow if you want to go through this in detail. The point is, it's, it's not really important, because again, these are our students. But just the range of things that students are using. Again, as Helen said, you have to try really hard to eradicate these things from your practices. It would be very hard to take all of them out. From the office tools, the institutional virtual learning environments, email, all the way down to more specialist things like GPS services, yeah, and just their, their real attachment, their love for particular devices, their attachment to their iPads. You know, that when they could afford these things, these were really meaningful things for them, irrespective almost of what they did with it. Now, what they were doing with those things was differentiated, not just in terms of who they were, but when they were doing it, what they were doing it for. So here, you know, in my bedroom, on my bed, it's mainly my mobile going through my emails. In the study room, laptop, with blackboard, research, entertainment. And what we were trying to do really here was thinking about the relationship between these domains and resources that they were using. What devices are they using when? What are they using for study and work and what's for socialising? Are they the same thing and are they different? How do they manage that? There are also things which ties into the whole skills agenda about how the resources are not the same depending on where they are. Accessing email was different when you're in the institution within that protected firewall than when you're outside it trying to get through the firewall before you can do anything. They did talk about skills, there are specific things about it, but what they don't talk about is just having skills. They talk about skills really in quite a problematic way. They talked about skills in libraries and different databases. I thought that was one of the skills you gain when you do this type of work. What they went on to say is, but it's not the same in every institution because every database works slightly differently. They also were talking about using things like EndNote and how frustrating it was that the version of EndNote had changed and they no longer knew what to do with it. So these were not things where you've got to sort of learn once, do always kind of situation. These are things in which they're always having to relearn the skills, they're always having to adapt. <coughs> there are also things which are more about the, the issues, as Helen mentioned, not just of getting access to information, but coping with it when you get it. So this one was about conversations on a virtual learning environment. It's too time consuming to trawl through it. So what I found more helpful is you get email alerts, you check occasionally, you look at the stuff that's coming in, go and check once a day. So they're finding out strategies. All this stuff is going on. How do I find the bits that pertain to me? How do I cope with that? So this was not about the techniques of searching. This was having done some searching, what do you do with the overwhelming amount of information you've got? They're also learning about new kinds of resources that they had to, to work out what the practices were. Study resources, the databases, the virtual learning environment. Disciplinary resources, such as particular software packages for statistics or whatever it was they were doing in their discipline. And professional resources, for example, our PGC students all had to come to grips with what interactive whiteboards were and how they used those. And these were not the same for the groups. They were differentiated again in terms of the subject of study, the, the sort of quite kind of degree they were going for and so on. But the consequence of this is, because of this complexity, they didn't know who to turn to, and it wasn't the same person every time. They didn't know whether they could ask help desks, they didn't know whether it was appropriate to ask their tutors. If they were studying at a distance, they didn't actually see themselves identified with the institution in any meaningful way at all, they just only knew to ask their tutor. So the tutor became the conduit for all these queries, whether that was appropriate or not. So there's some structural questions here about how you provide that kind of support and help for students, but also how you educate students so they know who it's appropriate to ask. The complexity of all this, as Helen said, this is kind of permeating everything they do. And the real issues for the students is when do they want to bring bits of their lives together and when do they want to keep them separate? So here's a student talking about, you know, there's like pictures of me doing stupid things on Facebook. I, don't want, I want to keep that separate from what I'm doing in my academic context. They're using words like dangerous. And this student was talking about another institution that used to have its own email server and provide you with email. Now it's provided by Gmail because they've outsourced all their email hosting solutions to a commercial provider. I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the idea my work email knows what shopping I do. You know what I mean? I just find the whole thing is starting to get a little bit scary. So there are things which are happening both for the students and also infrastructurally around them, which are either bringing together or forcing apart bits of their lives. Now this is another map. Again, it's very faint. But the important thing to see about this is for this student, he's got two or three institutions over here and rooms in it. 
And as far as he could possibly put it on this side of the screen, that's home. And he's even drawn a little dashed line down the middle just to keep them separate. They really wanted to be able to draw the line between what they were doing in their studies, what they did in the rest of their lives. They needed to find ways of keeping them separate because they found that this was bleeding over in ways that were not helpful to them. They wanted it to be, it not stopped, but under control. So the real question is here about whether resources and services are segregating bits of their identity or forcing them together. You know, there are these different social networking services, academia.edu, Facebook, LinkedIn, that could be seen as relating to very different kinds of spheres of life. Your academic <coughs> life, your personal life, your professional life. But then you get things like Facebook study groups, and the whole thing gets much more complicated. There's questions about how they identify with the institutions, they identify with the buildings, they identify with the portal page, the email account, the tutor, and how they're forming communities or failing to form communities or whether those groups are hindering or helping them. Are they perpetuating what you might describe as bad learning because the practices they're sharing are really not helpful? Or are they supporting moments of crisis, helping students <coughs> to cope? Now I want to throw in this image. This is one of the images that one of our students has given us. This is digital literacy. <laughs> this was a student who, their digital literacy practice involved getting a whole load of academic texts, digitising everything, even if that broke copyright, they didn't care, slapping it on their iPad, which they then put into one of those sealable plastic bags, and they read in the bath. <laughs> this, for us, was, it was just a lovely sort of bringing together of the very, very personal private and the very scholarly. This was how they did their academic work. So this, for us, was a really nice example of being digitally literate, but it's not the kind of thing you like to get introduced to when you're doing things like skills training. But actually, this is what helped that student cope because reading was stressful, there were all sorts of anxieties, the bath was relaxing, this is how they wanted to do it. So what I'm suggesting really is there's a need to think about skills development. It's a really important area, but we may need to think about it a bit differently. The generic and transferable things, the sort of ECDL frameworks, sure, it's useful, but it doesn't go enough, go far enough, because it's hiding all of this complexity. The real achievements of skill use involve all these kind of other things that bring together resources, people, context, in specific places, at specific times, for specific purposes. What we're really interested in at the moment is how you can help students develop what we might describe, what we started to talk about as a sense of resilience. So that when bits of these networks, when some of these connections, when a particular device fails or isn't there or changes in some way, how do they learn to cope? So it's less about teaching them the skills they need now, more about helping them work out how to develop those skills in the future. And here really is just a bunch of questions to end with. You know, what are the technologies the students are using? Are they helping or hindering them? How do they learn to use them? Can they bring them together? Can they be helped to keep them separate? What are we requiring them to use? Because there's lots of good evidence that say, well, actually, when students are required to use stuff, they do it. They can do that. <coughs> we can trust them to go off and do it. They may struggle with it. We may need to help some of them. But actually, most of them can engage. But we don't know where they do it. We don't know when they do it. We don't really know who helps them with it. And how can we help them to help each other? Can we get them sharing examples? of these kind of ways of working, ways of doing these things, which will help them be more resilient in the future. Do you want to do questions jointly? Yeah. Okay. okay, questions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I think, you know, this comes back to sort of some of the points Helen was making. Nobody has expertise in everything. And we have expertise in things our students don't. We know much more about how the academic game works than they do, because, you know, we've been doing it for longer than most of them. Not all of them, but most of them. You know, so we have things we can offer them which help with that side of it. And like Helen was saying, sometimes you need the expertise from them to share the examples of how they've brought these things together themselves, which fill in the, side, the bits of the picture where we don't have that expertise. None of us knows all this stuff. And I think if you're trying to know all this stuff, you're in a hiding to nothing. Even if you mastered it now, you wouldn't know it tomorrow. Because these things are moving. You know, it always has been thus, ever was thus, ever will be. You know, so if you're trying to get the whole thing pinned down, it's not going to happen. 
But if you can start to build in these conversations, share ideas, share practices, rather than you being the person who has to answer all those questions, say, well, I'm not quite sure, but this group of students over there, they've been doing this really interesting thing with blah. Why don't you ask them? And try to sort of start building those, those groups. I mean, what we're trying to work with, are, by and large, is sort of examples, repertoires, cases. Not because those cases become definitive and authoritative and the rest of it, because they're, so they become a source of inspiration. Yeah. yeah uh, you mentioned one of the students has commented on the fact that other students got separate to discrete Facebook accounts. That suggests that you're using Facebook in some manner to, to engage in the student's learning. Is that the case, or, or is that just a I'm not. I have no idea whether other colleagues at the institution are or are not, but it's quite possible they are. Right. But that's the thing, we're not mandating any of this stuff. Individual tutors are co-opting other technologies just as the students are. And that's where the whole thing gets even messier, because you know we have a sort of institutionally approved set of things. That's fine, we can kind of work with that, we know where we stand with it, but of course, you know, we can't really tell everyone in the institution they can only use those, because they just wouldn't listen to us. And then the students bring in different things as well. So, you know, if there's a non-institutionally supported thing which is becoming a part of the course and a student hasn't used that before, whose job it is to support that? So that's where some of these things really fall back on you. Is the tutor going to provide the support because they're bringing it in? Are the students going to help each other? So, yeah, I mean, you know, there are those things happening. We're not necessarily saying they're a good thing to do. Any more than we're saying they're a bad thing to do. It's just a thing that's happened and we now have to cope with that. Can I, can I respond a bit to the thing about resilience and fear? Because I've just been reviewing um, baseline reports from 11 different professional associations, of which Aldine was one, um, about digital literacy and their members' attitudes and, and, and sense of their own resilience. And those words that Martin was using, that students were coming up with about danger and fear and threat, I mean, I've pulled out so many words of anxiety, of, of concern. And, you know, some of it were the sense, I'm not keeping up. And some of it was just, I'm not keeping up. But some of it was definitely, I'm not keeping up with students. And, I mean, I don't know how many of you were at the Aldean conference, but I shared at the keynote there my sense of relief when I finally arrived at the point of realising that there is no way of keeping up. There's no way I can keep up with my team at all, thankfully, because they're very good at what they do. Uh, that there is no way of keeping up with everything that every student might be able to do. And I think for some students that can be very troubling, as well as for some of us, when we look to them for expertise. I mean, if you think of, as, as Dilly was saying at the beginning, that the last knowledge revolution on a similar scale, which might be the advent of print, you know, it was, it was decades, if not hundreds of years, before ordinary people had printing presses. I mean, it was some time before they had books, but we had the printing presses. We're in the middle of a revolution now where this technology is unbelievably affordable and the people who have time to experiment with it are experimenting with it, and that's generally not us. So, you know, the, us as guardians of knowledge have to accept that there's a massive <coughs> knowledge revolution going on all around us. And I think as a public institution of knowledge, it's, it, it behoves us to admit, admit that we're on shaky yeah. ground with some of that and to bring our students in to help us cope. But I do think there is fear both ways then to be managed because a lot of students want to know that we know and we're going to tell them. And a lot of us want to feel that we know and we're going to tell them. So there's fear both ways to be managed, but that's what doing development work is about, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, part of that as well is knowing, you know, that you, part of that knowing that you don't have to know everything is knowing that other people in the institution might do. You know, there are specialist teams that have been set up to do other things, or there may be other individuals you know, in your team who, who do the videos, or who make the hand drawings, or whatever it is, that you're never going to do. It's fine, I don't tweet, I can live with that. <laughs> it doesn't keep you awake at night. <laughs> I think there are issues there about compliance with standards, I don't think it's exactly about it, that actually, yes, there is, of course, a huge proliferation of you know, two resources and development tools on a daily basis. Yeah. It's important to make sure it's not something that's within the amber of our kind of control because it's kind of about kind of commercial values. But you know that there is a set of tools that, that at least that you can extrapolate the data from one into another and make yeah. some sense of it. Because uh, I think part of the problem is that sometimes you can develop something like a particular tool and it won't talk to other tools, or something goes down. Oh, yeah, yeah. Lost. Yeah. Uh, that's not something that, that's an observation rather than a question of whether we can do about it. It would be bad for consideration. Yeah, I mean, there have been all these sort of pushes to interoperability and stuff, which is partly addressing that. But, I mean, the people who care about that aren't necessarily the students. You know, they are not going to stop using their iPad or whatever because it doesn't talk to the PC lab down the corridor. And it's kind of up to us to cope with that as best we can. But the problem is, we've got to be honest. Again, it's this sort of limitations thing. Be honest about our limitations. It's fine, you use your iPad, but we can't back up your data for you. 
So long as you're okay with that, then we can get along fine. But it is that kind of sense of we can understand what the implications are. We need to be able to, you know, it's that it really comes back to informed consent. If you want to do that, that's fine. But here are the consequences. If those are okay with you, you know, we're not going to stop you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, lots of stuff came out about boundaries. I mean, in some ways, all of this is about boundaries. And the, the pictures, we got all of them to draw pictures, and almost all of them were complicated. The only ones that weren't complicated, probably they haven't put everything down on a piece of paper. And we have some lovely examples, like the guy who uses the virtual post-it notes on his computer for one set of things, and a physical set of post-it notes down the side of the screen for another, as a way of, you know, because they have different, to him, they, they seem to have different qualities of permanence. And, you know, so there's all this stuff which is about exactly those issues, but, you know, getting them to talk about it, we can certainly start doing that. Advising them on what they should be, you know, <laughs> I think that's beyond where we've got to. We know, that, and because a lot of these things have to be in play and have to be different for every student, some students need to bring their personal histories to bear on what they're doing. Other students are desperate to keep them separate. So for the, the boundaries for those kind of students have got to be totally different. I mean, I would just say from my research as well that there's an almost 50-50 split that tends to be between students who and, and people <coughs> who want to put everything in one place and those who want to keep their different identities very separate. And I think that's a key, if we're going to use the phrase digital literacy, which is a, compl- a difficult one, I think for me, you know, it is about talking about things at that level, not can you, can you, it's not a keystroke level, but how do you manage, how do you personally manage the public-private divide that technology is troubling, how do you use technology to manage that, how do you manage it in other ways? And this is a, an issue for professions. If students go on from here into professions, these are the issues they will be struggling with, not can I turn on my PC. So when we're talking about the digital with students, it's precisely at that kind of level we should have the conversation. And the only other point I'd add to Martin's term resilience is repertoire. Yep. I mean, I yep. think what, what you're describing and what we're seeing with the digital pioneers is having this immense repertoire of, of technology. I mean, you know, t- pens are tools, aren't they? But yep. a whole range of analogue and digital tools. And the bigger the range you use, in a sense, the more you have at your fingertips to manage knowledge, to manage communication, to manage to manage the things we're going to ask students to do. And I think we have to embrace that repertoire, even when some bits of it might be unfamiliar to us, because it's broadening all the time. And that's how we have resilience, to have a, a broader repertoire. Do you want to ask a question? Okay. Last question? Last question, if there is one. Oh, there is, yeah. I can tell you from the University of Exeter that we are piloting something that looks a bit like a uh, an open plan office in each of our colleges. So we've identified that an awful lot of learning about about practice goes on in open plan offices where people look over each other's shoulders. So in each college, we're inviting staff and, and students to an event where effectively we bring lots of people we know are doing interesting things with technology in the context of their discipline into a room to have lunch 
to do their thing, whatever it is, to get on with it, and everyone is invited to come and walk around, look over their shoulders, and ask them what it is they're doing. So if you're at the University of Exeter, you have a chance to be in one of those open plan offices, and we hope that that might be one example of something we might do. So plug over, Martin, have you got any more? No, we've ways? got no good ideas, so if you've got any great ones, let's <laughs> Okay, thank you very much to all our speakers this morning. That's been absolutely fantastic. Um, we now go and uh, have some coffee outside.